Panic at another Walmart. A man in body armor and an assault style rifle walking through a store in Missouri, terrifying shoppers and following them outside as they escaped. That's where a retired firefighter ended the threat, holding him at gunpoint until police came and made an arrest. That gunman is now facing a terrorism charge, even though he never fired a shot. And tonight we're learning what he told police about why he went to that Walmart so heavily armed. ABC's Gio Benitez leads us off. Tonight, Dmitry Andrichenko is in jail on charges of making a terrorist threat after setting off fears of a mass shooting. Male wearing a bulletproof vest and an AR around his neck has just walked into the store and is recording himself. Just after 4 p.m. Thursday, the 20-year-old walked into this Walmart in Springfield, Missouri, dressed in body armor, carrying an assault rifle. Police say he had 100 rounds of ammunition, a store manager pulling the fire alarm, sending customers fleeing outside. I realized it wasn't a hunting rifle, that it was an assault rifle, and that really scared me. Minutes later, a bystander, Julie Ballou, capturing this terrifying scene. The suspect walking right towards her car with his hands up in the air. Get a handgun in his waistband. I was about to get out of my car when I heard a voice off to my left say, is that a rifle? Is that a real rifle? A former firefighter confronting Andrichenko, he does not want to be identified. I drew my weapon, told him to put his hands in the air. He complied, was compliant the whole time. He was videotaping on his phone, um, which was kind of odd. Tonight, police saying Andrichenko told them he, quote, wanted to know if that Walmart honored the Second Amendment and that due to three recent shootings and a stabbing, he wanted to protect himself. Police looking at these videos of Andrichenko shooting target practice with a semi-automatic gun. His intent was not to cause peace or or. or comfort to anybody that was in the business here. In fact, he's lucky he's alive still, to be honest. Gio joins us now live. Gio, we just heard it there. Police shedding light on the gunman's possible motive. And in a week that seen two mass shootings, the suspect in this case told police he was surprised by the panic. And this is really astonishing, Tom, because he's apparently now claiming to police that he never expected people to react this way, that he wanted his sister to record it on the phone. She said it was a bad idea, so he ended up recording it himself. And says he was attacked in downtown Manhattan for wearing a Make America Great Again hat. The 35-year-old art store owner took cell phone video of his swollen face after the alleged assault. He says he left work Tuesday night to have some drinks with a client when he was beat up by a group of people near the Canal Street subway stop. He claims a woman in the group knocked off his hat and then someone pushed him, causing his face to slam into a scaffolding pole. It's kind of ridiculous uh, to get beat up like this for wearing a hat and uh, just very upset that the, the NYPD has not made any arrests. As he called the police after it happened, but refused medical attention at the scene. A hunt for a gunman who killed two people after crashing his car into theirs during rush hour, then unloading round after round into their vehicle. The shootout on a busy highway in Houston, backing up traffic for miles. But the gunman drove away before police arrived, and tonight they're asking for the public's help to find him. Here's ABC's Clayton Sandell. Oh my God. Houston police tonight are searching for a gunman who turned a rush hour freeway into a deadly shooting gallery. Oh. One victim lying on the ground as good Samaritans desperately try CPR to keep him alive as Interstate 10 traffic backs up for miles. They arrived to drive by shooting his panic male teen shirt holding a really deep gun shooting at another car. Investigators say it started around 6 last night. Two suspects in a dark sedan ramming into this silver car, forcing it to spin out. Witnesses say one suspect jumped out of his car, firing what appeared to be an AR-15 rifle. He actually pursued the vehicle as the vehicle rode down the hill, firing rounds at the vehicle as it rolled. At one point, the vehicle came to a stop. He got in front of the vehicle and fired rounds into the front windshield of the vehicle. The two men in the silver sedan were killed. Houston's police chief says the murders are likely drug-related. This video showing what police believe are large bags of marijuana inside the car. We absolutely believe that a lot more witnesses are going to come forward because we really believe more people saw this. It was done in broad daylight. All right, Clayton Sandell joins us now. Clayton, we understand that another driver not connected to the initial incident also fired shots. That's right, Tom. There was another witness there with his own handgun who says he saw the suspect coming toward him. 
feared for his life, so he fired several shots. He is not sure if that suspect was wounded, but he says it was enough to cause that gunman to flee. A bunch of elites kidnapped normal folk like us. Where'd they get you from? Wyoming. Mississippi. Orlando. <laughs> and hunt us for sport. We were the first to tell you earlier this week about that NBC Universal movie, and now they're facing some backlash for moving forward with this controversial film, The Hunt. The film is about wealthy liberals hunting and killing deplorables on a reserve. The studio pulled ads for the film after the El Paso and Dayton shootings, but a source told Fox News, quote, there are no plans to not release the movie, double negative, no plans to move the release. Will this be a decision they come to regret? Joining me now is actor Robert Davi. Now, Robert, thanks for being here. You have starred in your share Thank of you thrillers, me. Die Hard, the Bond movies. Universal says The Hunt is a satire. Your thoughts on the cultural impact of this film being released at this moment? You know, the cultural impact, Hollywood has a responsibility on its cultural impact to society. And we just saw what happened in... Dayton, Ohio, and in um, Texas. What we saw happened in Las Vegas, which was a mm -hmm. shooting gallery for someone that we don't know much about what happened there, do we? And to do a film at this particular time, listen, freedom of speech, freedom of art, culture, I like that. I like people being able to express sure. themselves. But there's this responsibility to culture. How many kids are responsive? Who knows who kidnapped who, a group of people, and say, let's have fun? No, I haven't seen the film. I've just heard the controversial about it. Well, I, think, I, like I think when we know these mass shooters respond to violent imagery, to set up a picture where you have Americans hunting other Americans, this is problematic. The president seemed to talk about the hunt today. Watch this. You talk about racist. Hollywood is racist. What they're doing with the kind of movies they're putting out is actually very dangerous for our country. What Hollywood is doing is a tremendous disservice to our country. Robert Javi, uh, the filmmakers of, of The Hunt claim that the liberal elite hunters get their comeuppance when the deplorables turn the table on them. But why is it acceptable to kill your political adversaries, whether right or left? Isn't that normalizing political murder? Homicide. It's ro it's wrong both ways. It you know I mean imagine having a film where people are kidnapping Muslims or black people or Italians and having a shooting gallery and they I mean it's a, it's a no or Jews it's a no win film. You, I don't care if there's comeuppance. We shouldn't be propagating that in society. It's so dangerous. People out there in our society have problems. The mental illness. Yeah. This will affect someone, and someone will, who knows what idea that might, might uh, generate from this film. It's, it's a, not the kind of entertainment we should be doing. Well, it's a poisonous idea, and we've been hearing a lot politically about the rhetoric people use and that, how that leads to bad ends. Why don't potent images and storylines, far more persuasive than anything someone says, why isn't that considered also a variable here? You know or, what Lenin said go, about, go uh, you, know, you know what they said about cinema. It was the most important tool for propaganda. Mm. Yeah, so. well, the, well, let's pray it, it, it's not, but I, I fear you're right. Out of the growing mystery this morning, U.S. intelligence trying to figure out what really happened off the coast of Russia last week. We reported on that massive and deadly blast that released radiation. Now it's believed U.S. officials are looking into whether a new nuclear missile was connected somehow to this nuclear accident that killed uh, more than a half dozen Russians, including scientists. Let's get to our senior foreign correspondent, Ian Panel, this morning. You know, Ian, the Russians have been uh, secretive. They've said very little about this. Yeah, that's right. Good morning, David. Growing fears of a small nuclear explosion in Russia that killed seven, potentially involving a top-secret missile program. The explosion happened at a missile test site just off the northern coast of Russia on Thursday. The government initially saying there'd be no change in radiation levels, but local officials now saying levels had briefly spiked. Residents nearby reportedly stocking up on iodine, which is used to reduce the effects of radiation. Officials saying that a small reactor had exploded during an experiment, but Russian officials remaining tight-lipped about exactly what was being tested. American and European scientists are reported to suspect that this was part of a program to develop a new nuclear-powered missile that Russian President Putin has claimed is able to reach anywhere in the world. Russia, of course, has a history of secrecy over accidents, the worst being at Chernobyl in 1986. Iran is warning Israel this weekend against aiding U.S. missions in the Straits of Hormuz, saying that Tehran would view the action as a, quote, clear threat 
and reserving the right to take action. This comes following reports that Israel was going to assist the U.S.-led coalition to protect shipping there in the strait with intelligence. And with that, we bring in former Deputy Assistant Secretary of State in the Obama administration, currently Washington Strategy Group President Joel Rubin. Good to see you, Joel. Thanks. Thanks, Lydia. Uh, always nice to know where the Iranians stand. Well, they certainly stand against Israel, and there's no doubt about that. And uh, if Israel is going to support American intelligence gathering on the we, we know they do. They just said the quiet part out loud. <laughs> it's it, well, yeah, and and that's always been sort of behind the scenes. Right. So now Israel is getting overt with it. Uh, but Israel has the right to do to do that, and we, the United States, have the the right and the responsibility to get the most accurate information that we can about security in the Gulf. Right, and conceivably, we also have a real national security interest in keeping the strait open. We do, and frankly, right now, our policy is driving us in the opposite direction. We're seeing a lot more incidents at sea than we have in the past several years, and it's a dangerous moment. And this is why Congress recently as well did pass a, a bill that required authorization for military force by the U.S. It had 28 Republicans in the House supporting it, and it called on the, the president to seek military authorization if he's going to go towards right, the war. Right, this, this after the Iranians shot down the, exactly. the, the drone. At, at some point, though, Iran, say what you want about their nuclear facilities, but they're still the largest state sponsor of terrorism. Mm -hmm. They still have the blood of thousands of Americans yes. on their hands. Why is confronting them and trying to cut off their ability to fund Hezbollah and others a bad thing? There's nothing wrong with trying to confront them, but you have to do it in a smart way. And right now, we're self-isolating. Our policy may be punishing them economically. We've got a maximum pressure campaign, but we're not achieving anything at the table. And Iran has the ability to restart its nuclear program, and it puts us in this position of, well, what's next? Does it mean military strikes? Yeah, but, that, that's but where the last we're time, you know, you think about the last time the Iranians really got a punch in the nose from the United States was President Reagan in the 1980s. We didn't hear from a, from a while after that number one and number two we did it alone the israeli army has just shot down a fifth hamas gunman after he began firing at troops on the gazan border as he attempted to sneak into israel the fresh round of fighting comes just a day after the idf said it killed four heavily armed palestinians who were attempting to cross the border with weapons all of this comes a mere week after a palestinian gunman managed to wound three soldiers on the border before being killed Israeli soldiers opened fire on four former Hamas terrorists yesterday after one of them began to scale the border fence. A hand grenade was thrown at the Israeli troops during the clash, but none of the soldiers were injured. The four Gazan fighters were later found to have been armed with AK-47 rifles, rocket-propelled grenades, hand grenades, hunting knives, and bolt cutters. All four were wearing military uniforms and were also equipped with food and a medical kit. The Hamas leaders of the Gaza Strip are condemning their killing, but have not taken responsibility for the fighters' attempted attack on Israel. Shortly after their infiltration attempt, Israeli jets allegedly targeted an outpost operated by Hamas in the central Gaza Strip. As the U.S. maintains the pressure on Iran, tension is on the rise. American and British vessels have been deployed in the Gulf as the U.S. calls for an international military coalition to secure the Strait of Hormuz, one of the world's busiest shipping routes. But Iran's foreign minister, Javad Zarif, told Al Jazeera that the naval buildup could destabilize the entire region. This is a tiny body of water, and the more uh, foreign naval vessels you have in this body of water, the less secure it is for everybody. Uh, based on experience, uh, presence of the United States and foreign naval fleets in the Persian Gulf has never produced security. America will not be held hostage to nuclear blackmail. It all started last year when U.S. President Donald Trump pulled out of the landmark 2015 nuclear agreement with Iran, saying it was a bad deal. He then reinstated sanctions targeting Tehran and countries trading with it. The sanctions were soon felt in Iran. Its economy is struggling and inflation is soaring. Iranian officials remain defiant though, accusing the US and its allies in the Middle East of plotting to undermine their country. Iran spent last year $16 billion on, on all of its military, with almost a million people under arms. We paid 16 billion. The United Arab Emirates, with a total one million population, 
indigenous population, spent $22 billion. Saudi Arabia spent $87 billion. Now, if you're talking about uh, threats coming from countries in the region, the threat is coming from the United States and its Western allies who are pouring weapons into this region, making it a tinderbox, ready to blow up. Worried that the nuclear deal may not hold, the EU has established a mechanism to bypass the U.S. sanctions. But Tehran is calling for more. Its leaders warn if the sanctions continue, they will resume enriching uranium beyond the limit agreed under the terms of the 2015 deal. I got a very beautiful letter from Kim Jong-un yesterday. It was delivered. What did it was hand-delivered from. And it was a very positive letter. What? President Trump hinting he could meet again with the North Korean dictator in the near future for a third summit. That was just one day before Pyongyang fired off two more short-range ballistic missiles. State media there saying today Kim himself supervised the test firings of an unspecified new weapon system. Heightening speculation he could be jockeying for leverage ahead of any face-to-face. -face. This is the fifth round of missile launches in less than three weeks. And as you mentioned, they appear to be part of a new weapon system we haven't seen before. The two missiles were launched off North Korea's east coast on Saturday. Overnight, North Korea's official news agency released photographs of Kim Jong-un watching the projectiles from an observation post, appearing to supervise the test and calling it the launching of another new weapon system. Outside analysts examining the photos said the missiles were fired from a mobile launcher with two missile tubes that were unveiled for the very first time. They described these projectiles as new short-range ballistic missiles, and South Korea's military is reporting they flew nearly 250 miles before landing in the waters between the North Korean peninsula and Japan. The question now is, how does this affect future negotiations between the U.S. and North Korea? Until this point, President Trump has downplayed these latest missile tests from North Korea, and experts say that has allowed the country more room to step up its testing activity and build some possible leverage ahead of future negotiations. Talks have stalled since the collapse of the second summit between the U.S. and North Korea in Vietnam back in February. Since then, President Trump and the North Korean leader shook hands at the DMZ this past June and agreed to resume denuclearization talks. Also Saturday, North Korea lashed out at South Korea for continuing to host military drills with the U.S. at the DMZ and for its recent purchase of U.S.-made fighter jets. Just prior to this latest missile test, President Trump shared more about his latest letter from Kim Jong-un in a tweet saying that he offered a small apology for the series of short-range missile tests and say saying that the testing would stop when joint military exercises ended. The president also maintained his hope for a nuclear-free North Korea, saying that that could lead them to be one of the most successful countries in the world. Now, we have yet to hear from the White House about this very latest missile test, and this is the ninth one this year. After four days of intense fighting, finally some calm on the streets of Aden, but also an accusation of betrayal from the country's interior minister. Hundreds of vehicles landed in Aden, fully loaded with weapons and ammunition. This is to combat mercenaries, hired guns who are being manipulated. We are just fighting with our hands, with whatever. However, we criticise this silence from our brothers, Saudi Arabia. We condemn this silence for four days, while our partner in the coalition is slaughtering us. We will meet you soon on the ground. Hours later, it was reported that the minister had been evacuated from Aden to the Saudi border town of Sharura. In Mecca, his government's leader was photographed with the Saudi king. But Abu Drabo Mansour Hadi has lived in exile in Saudi Arabia for years. This latest battle for Aden began Wednesday when southern separatists backed by the UAE fought against Saudi-backed government soldiers for control of the city. By Saturday, the separatists had taken over the city's presidential palace as well as several military camps. A ceasefire was called that evening for the Eid holiday. Hours later, Saudi Arabia warned the separatists to stop fighting, then followed that warning with airstrikes on Aden's central crater district. In all, 
at least 40 people have been killed in the latest fighting. It's actually kind of odd that you would have a ceasefire so quickly because that allows the southern separatists to consolidate their gains rather than be ousted rather quickly. Uh, and so it, 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 it's clear that Saudi Arabia believes it can mediate uh, uh, and find a solution here, and I'm not so sure that they can do that easily. The UN's humanitarian coordinator for Yemen says it's heartbreaking that families are mourning the deaths of their loved ones after dozens of people were killed since Wednesday. This flag represents the southern separatists' final goal to once again create an independent state of South Yemen, which existed from 1967 until 1990. And the recent fighting has exposed a rift in the Saudi-UAE military alliance that has been at war with Houthi rebels since 2015. But it may also open a new front in a war that has killed tens of thousands of people and it's pushed the country to the brink of famine. Turning overseas, Hong Kong's airport canceled all remaining flights for the day after thousands of pro-democracy protesters crowded in to the main terminal. There's been turmoil there for a while, but an escalation in violence over the weekend led to bloodshed and mass arrests. Nearly 50 people were treated for injuries yesterday after police used tear gas and rubber bullets to disperse the crowds. Deborah Pata is at the Hong Kong airport. Deborah, good morning. What led to this violence? Good morning. All flights in and out of Hong Kong have been cancelled. Protesters have been camping out here at the airport for four days, greeting arriving passengers. The concern is rising that police plan to move in and take action against them. This comes after a weekend of flash mobs which exploded across the city and were met with even more aggressive action by the police. Using hit-and-run tactics, protesters emerged from subway stations, set up barricades, blocked roads, then quickly retreated to different locations. Those on the front line are mostly young students, like 18-year-old Vincent Chong. Instead of spending his summer playing basketball, he's been choking back tear gas and seen the inside of a police cell after being arrested. But he was back on the streets again last night. I don't think I'm doing the wrong thing. Even the, the police arrest me, I think I'm doing the right thing then. The past few days have seen a much tougher police response. Police tactics have definitely changed. They're moving in a lot quicker, a lot more determined and with a lot more force. Here, riot police advance on protesters from three different directions, leaving them nowhere left to run. On one occasion, tear gas was fired at point-blank range in an underground train station, creating a terrifying stampede. Police disguised as protesters turned on demonstrators. This young man begs for mercy as he's pinned down. I'm terribly sorry, he shouts. Please don't press on me. I understand. I've been arrested. And the injuries are mounting. This woman was hit in the eyes by a beanbag round filled with lead pellets. What began as a simple protest against a now shelved extradition bill has metastasized into full-blown hatred of the police. A former police commander, Alan Lau, has been brought out of retirement to shut down the protest, and the rhetoric from Beijing is growing increasingly ominous, with a senior Chinese government official saying that some of the protest action shows signs of terrorism. <laughs> This huge turnout shows that the government's crackdown is not working. Despite massive arrests in the past weeks, more people have gathered to demand an end to police violence and ask those detained to be released. What started as a local election protest has turned now into a broader movement. I'm here to show that I'm tired of uh, the fascism of uh, Moscow government against its own people. Alexander Salavyov is the only opposition candidate who tried to run in the Moscow election who is not in detention, at least not at the moment. Before the rally, we could only meet him at a public square because he's avoiding arrest by not going home. He had been detained for eight days after the previous protest. All the authoritarian regimes collapsed just because of their actions like this. Because they do everything vice versa. They suppress, they crack down, and uh, they try to stop the spread of information. They, stop, they try to stop something inevitable, something that you cannot stop. The 
they, they try to stop time, they try to stop progress. The detention of opposition leaders like Ilya Yashin and Alexei Navalny have not deterred people from taking to the streets. At the authorized rally, protesters were urged to take part in another unauthorized rally. And that's where police started to detain people. And again, part of the center of Moscow is under a lockdown. People are being detained for peacefully marching here through the city center. It was an unauthorized protest. People are being brought in one by one, dragged over the floor, detained sometimes with quite a lot of force. People have been screaming and resisting, uh, and they're all being brought into this bus. While Vladimir Putin is celebrating his 20 years in power, Analysts say more Russians want their voices to be heard. The citizens are demonstrating something brand new, a new way of interacting during these protests and, importantly, their persistency. It's not valued enough, but for a political process like this, it's the key factor. So far, the authorities have not backed down, although less people were detained than during previous weeks. But with tens of thousands on the street and more protests expected, pressure will only grow. They came out in their thousands, defying barricades and checkpoints, tear gas and anti-riot pellets, all infuriated by the Indian government for taking away their autonomy. Protests began after Friday prayers in Srinagar, the largest city in Indian-administered Kashmir. Security was eased for a few hours, but by Friday evening, the five-day lockdown was tightened again. Phone lines are dead, so is the internet. Getting to see a doctor is difficult. It was another long walk for the families of patients outside Srinagar's largest hospital. I can't even explain the hardship I had to face to get here. There's no food or milk for children. We are suffering. There are no doctors in the hospital. Here in New Delhi, a majority of politicians in the parliament backed the government's decision of revoking autonomy of the Indian administered Kashmir. But there are some who are skeptical about the timing and the way in which it's been implemented. India's economy is slowing. Tens of thousands of car factory workers are losing their jobs. All the issues around the economy have obviously taken a back seat. I mean, nobody is discussing that except business newspapers, which nobody reads. So essentially, yes, the performance of this government in this uh, term, as well as the previous term, has always been overshadowed by something or the other. Some believe it's Narendra Modi trying to leave his mark after winning the 2019 election with a massive mandate. The Modi mandate was not an economy mandate. It was not based on the dream of fulfilling jobs, economy, but it was a national security election mandate. And this is a legacy term for Modi. This is where he wants to leave a mark on India in the way the first term was merely a preparation for this. Modi leads the Hindu nationalist BJP. Repealing Article 370 on Kashmir autonomy has been one of its core ideologies. There's nothing clandestine about it. There's nothing hidden about it. There's nothing apologetic, being apologetic about it. We have done what we have stood for all this while. We've done of what we have committed ourselves to all this while. Modi looks like he's fulfilled the long cherished dream of his party. But it's not clear how his government can win the hearts and minds of Kashmiris living under lockdown. Chaos and confrontation inside the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound on the first day of Eid al-Adha. Usually non-Muslims are barred access on Muslim holidays, but for a second time this summer, significant dates for Jews and Muslims have overlapped. And for a second time, Israeli security forces decided to allow in Jewish groups, having said they would only do so if they assessed the security situation as favorable. Earlier on Sunday, tens of thousands of Muslim worshippers had answered the call from the Islamic Waqf the trust that operates the compound under the authority of Jordan to pray in and around Al-Aqsa. Other local mosques were ordered closed to maximize numbers. The Muslim officials aware that right-wing Jewish nationalists had been demanding access to the site, known to Jews as the Temple Mount, on Tisha B'Av, 
The day Jews mourned tragedies in their history, including the destruction of the first and second temples. Perhaps the key question about today's events is why the Israeli security forces decided to change their minds. In the early part of the day, they decided to ban non-Muslims' entry to the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound for fear of friction. They changed that position and friction ensued anyway. A police spokesman said the situation changed after they dispersed Muslim worshippers using stun grenades, tear gas and rubber bullets. He denied that was a tactic to clear the way for Jewish groups, saying security forces responded after chairs and stones were thrown at them. There has been an increasingly vociferous movement on the religious right in Israel for more access to the site, a change to the status quo arrangements in force since the start of the Israeli occupation in 1967. Yehuda Glick is a leading voice in that movement. I asked him whether the decision to allow access was a political one by a government that wants to satisfy right-wing voters ahead of September's election. Mr. Netanyahu last week told the police, you do what you think is right, I'm not going to get involved. And if you say online that he did it for political reasons, you are lying to your crowd. It has nothing to do with it. The decision was made uh, per se by the officers of the police. Palestinians, though, see this as intensely political. The senior PLO politician Hanan Ashrawi accusing Israel of recklessness and aggression designed to provoke religious and political tension. This holy site is, once again, a flashpoint and a focal point in the conflict.